Well, I'm Alex Garrett. Welcome back in. This is the second episode of the Abilities Hour because I'm trying to spotlight people that, yes, aren't in the news every day, but literally this kid has been, this kid, this man, uh, Danny Voice. You have been in the news, actually. You've been in the newspapers, and you, uh, you have a, a very unique disability, as, as many people do in the community, right? And by the way, welcome. Yeah. Yeah, so... I was born with funny people and a couple of other things. Um but the main thing is funny people. Um I have the there's three types. Um I have the most severe type, so I'm partially uh paralyzed from the waist down. Uh so I'm in a power chair. Um I've had, and I'm not proud of it, 62 surgeries, and I'm only going to be 30 in September. Um, it kind of feels like we're old people by now because of all the medical stuff we've had, right? I'm sure you feel that way. Yeah. So you're only 30, and that's a miracle in and of itself that you've made it to 30. So yeah. as you get older, and uh, this month comes around, this month of July, how much more prouder of the ADA do you get knowing what you've been through and yet here's an outlet where yes Americans with disabilities are honored uh, this month yeah uh, I'm very glad that um, they have a month that um, puts, uh, puts a light on people with disabilities and the ADA um, without the ADA uh, I wouldn't have the quality of life that I have now. Um, and I wouldn't have all the, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Accommodations yeah. that I need. Danny, does, because this month I also believe is in, about empowering, right? So yeah. Like even in the community, we could do better to empower those who are also disabled within this community. Like I feel like that needs to happen more. No. Yes, it does. Um. So I'm, I'm in a lot of phys um disability groups on Facebook, and from what I can see, I would say most people in those groups are depressed and have a negative attitude towards their disability. Um, they don't seem to um, see that there are ways to live life with their disability. Mm. Um, and all they can see is that they can't do anything. All they can do is sit around and do nothing go on Facebook, do nothing, but that's not true. You can, you can have a full life. You just yeah. need to know where to look. Danny, it, it's why I'm, I'm very excited every time you show me pictures of you going outside. Yeah, you went to the pond. Ladies and gentlemen, on this podcast, here's a man. He's got breathing issues. We've got spina bifida. He is someone, and I guess because I'm at risk too, people would say, why aren't they inside? Well, we don't want to be inside, okay? We believe, right? And I know you probably believe that you can do this through COVID mm -hmm. and out, right? And we need to get that message out there more. Yeah. I totally agree on that. And so how do you do it? You go to these chats, and I'm sure you're an outlet for many to just vent, and then maybe you, you uplift them. Would you say that? Yeah, um, some of them, yes. Um, others, I... Uh, fight well I wouldn't say fight but I get into a little disagreements with because they're just stubborn with mm -hmm. the negativity and why do you think do you think and I love all the parents in the disabled community let me put that out there I love your parents yeah I met your mom uh, at the rehab center where you were great woman yep. people I've gone to school with have had amazing parents but those, our parents are kind of a different breed. Like they really are the ones that say, you're going to do something today. 
Yet I do think yeah. that households with kids with disabilities don't handle it as well and probably don't empower their kids. Would you say that's accurate? Yes, I would. I think most, um, from what I've seen in uh, the disability groups, is that um, their parents um, are either not there for them or they shelter them um, too much. Mm. So they don't know anything. And they don't know how to strike a balance um, yeah. between anything, actually. So Exactly. Those who can speak up, what should be our goal? What should be our message? What, what, should be the, what should these platforms be used for maybe that they aren't being used for right now? Um, to, to advocate for ourselves and to let others know, mainly able-bodied people, that we're people too and that we can pretty much do anything that they can Mm-hmm. We just have to find a different way. And yeah, exactly. But also I think we need to, we need to try to light that even the disabled community, it's like a family. We do have arguments. We do have people that maybe get bullied within the community. That is just the truth. Wouldn't you say? Yeah. And so how do we change that culture? Cause I think that conversation needs to be had too. Good question. I, I don't know because that's, in every uh, different community, um, I know there's bullying in the within the gay community. Yep. Um, and even and the uh, minorities, uh, like the blacks, the Latinos, Asians, we all have the bullying right. within our own community. But I think it's important to talk about that because I think sometimes, I had to say it, but able-bodied people might say, oh, look at this kid. Well, no, uh, you want to step inside? We are rough and tumble people, you know? Yeah. I think that message also needs to get out as well. Exactly. That we, we can deal with it. We, we, I think having a disability has kind of given us the thicker skin than most. I agree. But where would you say the limit is? Because I know sometimes... Some could say something that hurts. So what, what's your limit between taking a joke and saying, well, that's not, that's not really cool? Well, to me, uh, uh, nothing actually offends me. So anybody can say anything to me. I don't care. That's the, on, the only thing that bothers me is um, um, there's a, a couple of phrases that I, People use that I don't I don't agree with. Um, one is when they say someone's in a wheelchair. Yes, we are, but we also use a wheelchair. Wow, that's that. So that's kind of what the logo is now, right? Instead of a guy sitting in a wheelchair, it's literally someone rolling in his wheelchair. Like, yeah, that's the visual of what you're saying there. Yeah, and um. Mm-hmm. Um, also, when they say um, confined to a wheelchair, no. That's just, we, can, we can get in and out of our wheelchairs. Uh, we might need help, but we can still do it. And um, the other one is um, wheelchair bound. No. Danny, you know, I've known you for, what, a few years now? And yeah around about everything but in my head I'm just thinking sometimes I don't know if I know all of Danny's story so do you want to share it with us a little more than maybe I would even know sure okay um what's a good story <laughs> oh I don't think you know this one um which has it has to do with the ADA actually um about five years ago um my mom came across this um, news article that she uh, kept from, from like years years ago, saying that if there's any um, uh, issues within uh, within your town, uh, call the call the newspaper, and they'll do a story on it. So there's a um, 
shopping center near me, five minutes away. Um, and um, before, five years ago, they only had like two handicapped spots and they weren't even near the main entrance like they're supposed to. Um, and also they didn't have the, um, the uh, spaces for the ramp. Um, um, for the, um, the van, the van with the ram. Um, so my mom called, uh, Newsday, uh, called that number and told them what, uh, what her concerns were. And then my mom, um, they, they agreed to do this, to this story. And my mom thought it would be a great idea to take me along to this shopping center to meet up with the woman. Um, and, uh, we talked to the woman and we told her exactly what, um, our concerns were. We showed her the two handicapped spots that were in the shopping center. And so Newsday followed up with the landlord of the, um, of the shopping center and said, um, uh, if you don't comply with the ADA within a certain amount of time, you're going to be fined uh, X amount of dollars. Uh, so uh, within, I'd say, a couple of months, uh, they complied and uh, they had, they added in like five more um no three more to make five um uh handicap spots Daniel, and one I mean, one right in the middle um, right in the front i feel the need to say this you might be disabled but you're not one to always look for a lawsuit you know what i mean and yeah you you really fought for that one because it, it mattered that one was worth fighting for but yep. i think now if, if you wanted to talk about it the fact that many do just use ADA as like a card to just sue and do anything, that's not right either, right? No, that's not right either. Uh, ADA um, is for, um, it can be used for anything. Um, like if you, um, if you need a service animal, um, any kind of accommodations for your job or school um even if you need um accommodations uh for where you live sure. um if you need like an aid or something um they cannot deny you any of that because of the ada but right and at the same time I think it's the responsibility that those in the disabled community have to not weaponize the ADA. Yeah, exactly. So do you, do you find yourself talking to those who say, I want to use the ADA to do this. And then you'll be, you ever talk to people who, are, who feel that and then say, well, let's think about it before you actually do it. Do you ever get to those conversations? I haven't really gotten into any of those conversations. Um, mostly because I don't, know anyone who used the ADA to weaponize. Well, that's good. And that means we're in a good circle. You know, that means you're in a yeah. circle. Um, although I will tell you a great story. I thought Max at the Smithsonian, Max Gold was really heroic in the way he did that. Yes, definitely. Uh, that was an act. That's almost patriotism right there. Um, yep. You know the story better than me. I just know he went to Smithsonian. I think it was a plane he couldn't get into or something to that effect. It was um, a flight simulator. Um, he, him and his brother went, and um, the um, to get to the flight simulator, they had to go up some stairs because um, apparently there was no elevator uh, to get up there. Um, and so his his brother decided to carry him up the stairs, mm. and. Um, a security guard or someone who worked there saw them and came 
running, yelling at them to stop. They're like, but he wants to go in the flight simulator, and he, he, the only way I can, he can is uh, for me to carry him there. And um, and they're like, well, you need two legs to uh, work the flight simulator, and. Oh, um, so I'm out of it. I'm out of that completely, then, huh? <laughs> yeah. So, and Max only has one, and so, uh, from my understanding, is um, his brother was going to go in the simulator with him to, so he can use his legs while Max uses his arms for the whatever, and um. There was a whole big argument between those two and the uh, worker at the Smithsonian, and uh, Max uh, told them he's going to sue them for discrimination. He did, and he won. He did. He did, he did definitely win. And what short-sightedness of the Smithsonian in, in that case? Yes. Yeah. And so th those are good. Um, but, oh, okay, so let me ask you this. So what can we do better in the, as a disabled community? What can we do better to truly be part of society? I feel like there's a whole, we need to stand out because there was, I'm like, well, do we need to stand out or do we just have to be with society? So I don't know, maybe I'm controversial saying that, but I just think we could do things differently, which is saying, yes, we will fight for what we deserve, but also, we will be so measured with that that you won't even though we have an issue because we're not going to talk about it all the time. I think there has to be that balance. Yes, I agree. Um, I think what we need to do in within within our community is um, is to get rid of the negativity towards mm -hmm. uh, disability um, within our our community, so that way. The rest of the world can see that, oh, they are valuable to our society. Um, they can do what we can do, just in a different way. Yep. And we need to let them uh, work and do everything else that we do, that they do. Danny, tell me about your college days, because you did have some college days. And you're still looking to go back, and I, I, I'm so proud of that. You're not giving up on that. So tell us about that. Okay, so I've been a college student on and off for about 10, 11 years now. Um, got my associates in 2013 at uh, Nassau Community College. Then went to Hofstra for like a semester and a half because I had some medical issues and I lost my scholarship to Hofstra because of it and they wouldn't uh, do anything about it. Um, so I decided to go back to Nassau to get my associates because I went for two years and transferred to Hofstra. Came back to Nassau, got my associates, graduated with Max mm -hmm. um, um, and then I went we were looking for another college for me to go to that was close by because of Ava Ryan. Um, so we we chose Malloy because um, it's five minutes away. Um, and I started in the fall of 2013 and I'm, and I'm still a student there. Um, but within those six, seven years, I've had a lot of medical issues that made me withdraw like, like so many times, and they're, they're still willing to have me back when I'm ready. That's a beautiful thing, and, and kudos to yeah. on that. Uh, do you find that other disabled students have that same kind of uh, opportunity granted to them if they get sick, or are some colleges hard-lined about this? Well, I know, I don't know, I don't know about now since I haven't been there in uh, seven years, but when I was at Hofstra, I know that even though Hofstra was 
uh, basically uh, built for people with disabilities. Uh, mm -hmm. um, th they weren't very accommodating for me when it came to my medical issues um, because um, again, I lost my scholarship because my grades were not what they wanted, but that wasn't my fault. So I kind of, kind of felt I, like I, I got screwed over by them. Mm. Danny, this is um, this is interesting because I'm I'm trying to think of a not vast or what is that vested? Did you ever need vested? And and did you? Oh yeah, yes, uh, yes. When I started Nassau Community College, it, that's when um, Vested started to help me. Um, and they've been helping me uh, ever since, but um, just recently because I haven't been to school in over two years now, um, they, they called like two months ago saying, um, asking me what my plans were I told them um and he said okay we're gonna we're going to close your case right now um but when you're ready to go back give us a call and we'll reopen your case that is great and I hope that happens sooner than later yeah me too Danny let's be honest though some in the some in the community may not know about resources or may not want to look into them Exactly. But part of of empowering the disabled community is just hey, here's some resources. Go find them and and work with them. Yeah. But like you said, um, I've back going back to the Facebook group that I'm in. Um, they, uh, I've seen a lot of people complain that about this and that. Um, and not being able to do this and that. And it's like, and I've commented quite a few times saying, yeah. um, there are resources out there, go find them. And mm. they're just so stubborn yeah. um, that they're like, nah, I'm not. They, they would fight me on it saying like, oh no, I'm not doing that, or oh, you don't know what you're talking about. Um, Are you considered too optimistic by some, would you say? Yeah, I would. And that's a shame, because I think you're bursting. Every post, Danny Voice post, by the way, bursts with positivity, okay? There's not, even if there's a down day, I think you have a way to say, you know what, I had a day, mm -hmm. got him here, and I think we all have to have that attitude. Like, we have a, yeah. you know what? We're getting through them. Exactly. Now, I don't know how personal you want to get. I know you've been writing about it, and it's kind of something we share similarly. But and it's something that actually we've worked through together in, in many mm -hmm. ways. Because I've been having some stomach stuff lately, and you've been like, yeah, well, you know, we can kind of relate on that, uh, which, which is very rare. I don't know about the colostomy. Um, I know you had that thrown on you very late in life, like in your, like last year or two years ago. Right? Two years ago, yeah. So that's a 20, hear me, 30, that's 28 years old. And yep. I guess for me, I wouldn't know what that's like because I've had it on since birth. Yeah. However, I've had my issues with it. I don't really come public with it, but I've had, since I was a kid, I had issues because when the bag breaks and it smells, it's just not pleasant. Yeah. However, you're getting help for that situation. And I don't know if you want to talk about that, but I think that's very good that you're seeking outreach to figure out how to combat this rather than internalize it. Yeah. So I've had a colostomy for, well, okay. It's a little complicated, but um, my first colostomy was two years ago. It wasn't working well. Um, and a fistula opened up and that's how it came out. Everything came out. So they said, okay, wait a year and we'll fix everything. So last year they fixed everything and 
they gave me a new colostomy that actually worked. Um, of course, I've had my issues with it, um, but everything uh, within the last two, three months, everything seems to be calm, calming down with, with it, and we have more of a handle on it. On it. Yeah, in the, last, in the last couple of weeks, I've had some leaks and everything, but um, it doesn't affect me like it usually did. Um, because I'm, well, first of all, I'm used to it by now. But also, it's just like, there's nothing to really get upset about. No. Um, no, it's not. In fact, I mean, for me, I've had some hilarious stories, which I don't know if I want to get into, but th- that happens too. But you just have a mentality through anything we go through, right? The, yeah. The mental and, attitude is so important. Yeah. And, Honestly, I was, I think the reason why, or at least one reason why I was so um, mad when, whenever I had a leak was because I was depressed. Mm. I was depressed for two years because of everything that happened with me. And I, I wasn't used to having a colostomy, so every time it leaked, I was I got angry about it, mm. and even up when, even on up until like March, April of this year, I was still mad. But I went. I've been going for counseling over the phone, of course. Um, actually, now on FaceTime. Um, nice. And um, yeah, finally. Um, and we've been working through it. Um, within. Um, about a month or two after I started my counseling, um, I started to um, feel better about uh, the, the leaks and everything, not as angry about it. Um, I just let it be. Um, and um, then just recently, the, like I told you uh, earlier, um, I had a talk with my urologist about everything that happened in the past two years. Um, I asked him about exactly what happened, how it happened, and why, you were knocked why out it for happened. Most of that, right? What? You were kind of knocked out for most of those procedures, no? Yeah, I was knocked out for every, every one of those. So you would, you um, really, no, you kind of woke up and it was there, and then it's like, how do I adjust to this type of thing? Yeah, um, because uh, the, the the way I found out about having a colostomy was by my parents, was even by the doctor. Mm. You know, every day I think I was like, here, Danny, by the way, because there was a stretch that I didn't hear from you for a week, and I was like, what happened? What's going on? Yeah. And here we are, and I think that's a gift from God, if, if anything. It definitely is. How do you feel being vulnerable about this and able to just talk about um, that you're having counseling and, and able to even share on these pages you're on about the ostomy? That has to feel somewhat empowering, doesn't it? It does. At first, um, even even two, three months ago, I was like, nope, not ready to share anything about my colostomy. Um, but once I had that conversation with my doctor uh, two weeks ago, I mean, and he explained everything, um, I was like, it was like the 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 depression went away, um, and I was more accepting, um, knowing that I had a colostomy, um, and that that's why I was able to open up about it in the group that I'm in. Danny, I don't know if I want to get that deep as much as you are. I mean, I've shared it publicly in some way or another, but I haven't really ever shared some of my real feelings about it. Like, I I don't know. I In sixth grade, I'll, okay, I'll, I'm going to be open about this. Let it all on the table, right? Be real. Yeah. So, sixth grade, 
I start smelling it. I tell my friend next to me, um, I think I want to cut the stoma off. I literally felt that that upset about it. Yeah. But I wanted to cut my stoma off. Mm -hmm. Let me say that. I wanted to cut it off. Yeah. But I didn't because I thought, you know what? God bless me with this hours old into the world. Yeah. And I think we both can say, if you have an ostomy, you can get through this. It's exactly. A, like the numbers of those with ostomy are actually increasing. Not only, mm -hmm. I think the numbers of stories are increasing too. Um, yeah. As they get diagnosed or after months of having it, they're, they're telling their story. Mm hmm And so have you connected with any of the ostomy groups too, like to, to get some guidance and friendship through that? No, that, that was, um, I talked about this with my therapist, um, a couple of months ago when um when we first talked about it but at that time I was like I'm not ready I'm not I don't want to talk about it um now um the group that I'm in that I shared this story um is that a disability group but um that that group, group to me is more of, more accepting than uh, any disability group because uh, it's funny because you would you would think a disability group there they would be more accepting of uh, different thing different uh, disabilities and different uh, uh, illnesses and uh, having having different ways to do things. And from what I can see, they're not. Mm. Uh, they always, they, it seems like they always have to one up you on um, having a disability and that's what's absurd. wrong with them. That's yeah. Absurd, but that's just my opinion. Yeah, no, it is. And it's like, okay. Uh, that's why I haven't really been active in my disability groups as of, um as much as I was. Um that and plus because every other post was about the pandemic and I'm like, no, I don't I don't need to know any more about this pandemic. So yeah, I No, sorry, go ahead. So I I stuck to the group that I'm in now, um, which I said was an which is an indisability group, but um they are open to me, um me. open open about um me sharing whatever I wanted about my disability and so I've been posting like crazy. Danny, uh I think you're opening a door to something where I could say that yes, there are power struggles within the disabled community just as much as yeah. anywhere else. And yeah. why I feel it's important to mention that is because let's face it. The average person looking at a disabled person or a disabled community, oh, look, they're nice people, they're this, and we are. Okay, how do I say this? We're, we're for the most part, a very awesome community. Actually. Yeah. We are very cool. Um, and also, you and I aren't as part of the community because we, we like to live out our disability and not so much constantly talk about it. Exactly. That makes sense. We live it out. We we are part of the world. We're not yeah. sitting behind a keyboard most days saying this that, and the other. We're out there. So I feel very disconnected from the community at that point. But where I feel connected is that we have to smash stigmas. We have to smash the stigma that you don't have to pity us because we're just as rough and tumble as you are, pal. You know I exactly message out for. So yeah. I mean, that's just, that's what it is. And now do I, of course I love when someone helps out, but again, it's like, well, okay, we see this video of someone helping out a disabled person. What was the true motive of that help? Yeah, exactly. Is it a genuine proposal when you ask him to girl with downs or a guy with downs out, or is it a, I'm being part of the community type of thing? Yeah. And personally, I guess I will push back when I feel like the the commentary can get a little much. Like, I don't think that's soft. Mm -hmm. I think that's just, hey, that's dealing with my health. Why are we joking about my health right now? Type of thing. Yeah. But 
um, on the bigger on the bigger picture, it's like I'm not going to be with someone who who uh, and this is in general who makes me feel like they're dating me because they feel bad. I'm not ever going to do that. Yeah, I'm never going to settle for that. That does that's not me. Exactly. I can have friends that say, well, you know, you're cool and all, and I, you know, I don't know. It just gives off the vibe that they don't do it genuinely. We're we need genuine. Yeah. And I agree. Um, I'd say nine times out of ten, people help because they feel better about themselves than, oh, I'm helping a disabled person. I'm a good person. And what do you say to those who try to attempt to do that with you? Or do you find that's not a case anymore? Oh, no. That's, so, that's still very much the case. And um, I might, most of Nine times out of ten, I'll be like, no, it's okay, I got it. Um, sometimes I'll, I'll let them help me if I really need it, but most times I'm like, no, I'm good, thanks. I was in the middle of a scene in a park a couple, I think I told you the story a few weeks ago. <laughs> I had a kid saying, uh, pointing and looking at my leg. And then I swear to God, this was like Curb Your Enthusiasm content right here. This older man, like in his 60s, 70s, points yeah. over to me in the middle of the park and says he's missing his left. <laughs> like, what? What? You're telling the whole park, say this missing left. And I'm like, dude, come on right now. And I'm sure that's happened to you, right? Um, or like adults point at your wheelchair or something weird like that? Probably, but. Honestly, I don't pay attention to people around me. Um, <laughs> I just go about my business. By the way, he was on the other end of the bench, rolling his eyes, and this guy was like, "Look at this guy, man!" <laughs> uh, Larry David, you couldn't write that any better. I mean. <laughs> yeah, but it's true that I think there are still sections of sectors of adults that don't get it. That's true. And we're their age, some of them. But then yeah. when, when they're older, it's like you're 60. How are you thinking like this, you know? Yeah. It's kind of like weird. And just like a story I have, um, not relating to me, but I've watched this. Kid with autism started punching one of his service aides or his aides on a subway platform. Yeah. I had to really clamp down on this kid because he was getting too aggressive. This woman across the tracks who knows nothing probably about the autistic community or knows nothing yeah. about it, says, why are you hurting him? And I'm like, this lady, lady, the guy is trained to help this kid, you know? And so it's just amazing how it just pops up every day. And this is 2020. But yeah. This isn't a time where, you know, 1950s, I truly believe it probably, or even 1910s, it was probably rare to see a guy with whatever walking around. Yeah. yeah. Everybody's out. The whole world's out at this point, you know? Exactly. I've got to ask you this, though. So we have um, one movement. How do I say this? All right, let me ask you this. People who go on disability, because I feel like this is an yeah. issue to me. People who go on disability but probably can still work and still do things that uh, maybe for a downtime they couldn't, but they can easily get back into it if they want. I just think we have to get people to recognize that those who claim disability may not always be truly disabled. Mm -hmm. And that's a big problem. Um, I plan on that, but I, I figured you might have some, some thoughts. Yeah, no, um, I've heard stories about that. And it's like, we need some, they need to somehow prove that they have a disability um and i know it's that's kind of hard to do um i know you can't really ask for proof um because it might be an invisible disability but let me let me they need something yeah the invisible disability is real let's put it that way yeah However, there's probably people out there that say, I'm this, and we're like, uh, you're probably not because we know what this is. 
Yeah. And so, and I would, I, this is why every time I have a chance, I would encourage people to go to the games, right? So if you bring these kids at a very young age, like, you know, you were at a young age, but you also had friends who were as young going to these things, right? You had your school supporting you. Yeah. So those moments are great because it's bringing the able-bodied section of the school to, and I really don't like saying the special needs section of the school. That does not sound right to me. It really, it, it, to me, it's, it's, you know, the disabled community of the school. Yeah. And so when you see those kids su supporting their friends who are disabled, that's emotional. That's like, that tugs at you. Yeah. And we don't, I don't, I don't know if I see it enough at the games. Like, I just wish people would get off Twitter, get off Facebook, and just start coming to things that, hey, if you really feel like, okay, if you're upset Trump bullied a kid, a person who's disabled. And by the way, these are the same people who yell at me for stuff. And it's like, first of all, if you're going to put yourself out there as any kind of report or any kind of talking head, which I don't feel like I am, I just announced a podcast. But whoever puts something out there will be deemed for criticism. Now, did Trump take it too far? Yeah, I think he did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Never. Um, to then uh, say, well, you're disabled, so you must hate that you did this. Well, what if I'm very indifferent because I've experienced stuff before, you know? Yeah. What if I'm indifferent because I know that someone who's disabled and doesn't shut up, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I'm, I'm going to be up for some kind of criticism. Which yeah. Actually, this guy who wrote the Times article was up for. I gotta say that right here and now. He was up for that. Mm -hmm. And so, um, the point I'm trying to make though is that those who are upset at that, they still won't go to the games for physically challenged. No matter yeah. how many times we tell them, oh, what? You're upset about <laughs> great. You're upset about pre existing conditions being cut? Yes, we don't want that funding to be cut. No. Or, do not sit behind your computer and just say that this is happening because of Trump or this is happening because of this. Sudden. It's happening. Yeah. That's what it is at the moment. But if you're going to put the blame on someone, which seemingly is happening more every day, mm -hmm. take it upon yourself to go and see what's actually going on. Go out there and make a difference. Exactly. And the March for Fifth Avenue, I've never really done the, the Disability Pride Parade, but I'm sure it's good. But I also believe that we can live out our disability and i mean marching is great but what can we do after that you know what i mean yeah exactly uh because we have a lot of smart minds i mean just my viscardi graduating class alone yeah got friends you know max works as a security guard he he's working mm -hmm. yeah city. adeline was the state department for a while i mean all these people who graduated um did something and uh and they, I think that class serves an example of what we could do in society. And we need to talk more. Yeah. How about you? So in your school, were you sort of lumped in with everybody? Or did, you, they, were, did they put you in a section with the special needs? Where, where were you when you went to school? Okay, so elementary school. Okay, so uh, let's go all the way back to preschool, uh, kindergarten. Um, I went to a uh, special needs school called um, Boston's Calling Road in Mazapequa. Mm -hmm. um, for uh, nursery, free school, and kindergarten. Um, grade school, whatever. But after kindergarten, they said to me, they said to my parents that. I should not be in that school. I'm too, I'm too smart for that school. Sure. Not, and I should be in a regular school. Um, so, um, when, so when first grade came around, I started in a regular mainstream elementary school. But, um, because I'm coming from a special needs school, mm -hmm. um, they decided to 
stop me in special ed class, mm. uh, first grade class, um, just for, so I can get used to being um, in a regular school. So from first grade to the middle of second grade, I was in special ed, and then they transitioned me over to a regular mainstream class. And I, I was um, welcome with open arms. No one um, bullied me or anything. But I think that's because the elementary school that I went to, um, there were a lot of um, special ed classes. Um, so the able-bodied people uh, were used to us. Um, seeing us around, so um, that's why I don't think I've ever, ever gotten bullied or anything like that. And then um, throughout my school years, I was actually pretty popular with everyone, and I knew yeah, everyone. Right. You got that wit, you got everything going for you, so I'm not surprised about that. Yeah, I knew everyone, and everyone knew me. I was, um, Okay, in my in my school there was no clicks. Everyone knew each other. Everyone liked each other for the most part. Um, so I fit in, fit in with everyone, and I had a great school experience. Well, that, that's awesome. You were able to experience that. And again, how do I say this? It's like you didn't. You just acted as if you were you were like one of the normal cool kids. Mm. Say, well, look at me. Yeah. You said, no, I'm having this. I got this. I love this. And take me or leave me is kind of how I feel. Yeah. But were you talking yeah. like, from ages? When did you really start talking and, and, and couldn't shut up? No, I'm just kidding. Oh. Actually, that, that actually is a funny story. Um, so I was a late, late talker. Um, I didn't talk until I was about three years old. Um, and it was because of my, um, one of my best friends from preschool, his name is Terrell, um, he got me to talk. He, one day he just started talking to me and I talked back and from there on, I never shut up. And that's a good thing. We don't want you to shut up, Danny. Uh, no. Although I will, I will say, mm -hmm. um, Back in 2014, because of a because of a medical uh, issue from surgery, I did I did lose the ability to speak for like three months. So technically, I did shut up for three months, but after that, I never stopped. That's that is awesome. Um, yeah, I don't know. And by the way, Terrell Pierre is who you're talking about, right? Which Terrell are you talking? About? Yeah, I know you know him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think I went. I think that's a good one to Viscardi with. But, uh, yeah, yeah. So we're all connected in that way, and that's what I want to ask you about next. We have these platforms. We always are talking. We we do stay active on all of them. Yeah. Instagram for a minute, and I find this on TikTok. That there's a community on TikTok where you can literally bond with people who are disabled and amputee and. Yeah, I'm not ABT, but they kind of get where I'm coming from. Anyway, what about you? Do you find that you have communities in the Instagram world off of Facebook? Um, mostly, mostly Facebook. Um, because uh, there's actual groups uh, mm. for disabled people. Um, Instagram, I found uh, a few uh, disab disabled people that I um. But there's only one um, follower of mine, and I follow him too, um, who I actually communicate with over DM on Instagram. Cool. And by the way, um, on that note, what can the platforms themselves do better to give a bigger voice to the disabled community that we don't already have? Um. I think um, 
Mm-hmm. That's a good question. It's, that's kind of hard. I should say Instagram because Instagram, um, you just follow people. So, um, but like Facebook, um, uh, I mean, there's so many, so many disability groups um, already. Um, but I think like, uh, you know, so I know sometimes uh, Facebook highlights uh, different um, yeah. holidays and different move- movements and everything. I think they need to highlight um, like the ADA month more um, yeah, I mean, and actually, I more know. disability and uh, more like people who are like famous in the disability community like um um that that um that extreme wheelchair uh guy uh Alan following him. Okay. Um he he it's basically, basically uh what he does is basically he's like a he's a he's like a skateboarder but only you know in a chair. So he does. I might have he does all the skateboards stuff in a chair. That's sick. That's very. Yeah. By the way, adaptive sports is incredible, isn't it? Like I don't know if you ever tried it, but I love adaptive sports. And um, we used to do it. They used to do it all the time: softball, ice hockey, or sled hockey, I should say. Yeah. Do any adaptive sports? Um, I haven't done. Uh, any of them, but when I was in elementary school and middle school, um, every year in March, um, they would have um, the Nassau Kings play the uh, elementary school teachers, and I would go to the games. Uh, um, and I would actually um, play in the game as an honorary king so. because I know um, um, what is it? Uh, older. Oh, what the hell is it like? I'm drawing a blank. Uh, from the Nassau Kings. Yeah. I'm not uh, that. He's the he's the basketball coach. I just called it. Oh, Joe Salonica, of course. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, because I knew him personally because of the Spider Bipper Association. He let me play. Member on that in the game. Yep. He just became a board member for the New York State Spina Bifida, which is which is awesome. Oh, nice. So, wow, we're going down memory lane, and let me keep you there for a minute, because another big part of your life that I think, and I've only known it for a few years, but judging the way you talk about them, we can't let this conversation end or stop without talking about Camp Anchor. I mean, that is... Yes. A special yes. Part. And that's how you know Max, right? That's how I know Max. 18 years. So you want to elaborate? What did they do to empower you and make you feel... As normal as you could. Well, okay. So, all my life, I've never let my disability uh, uh, lead my life. Um, I always let my personality do that. Um, so, going to um, anchor. I, well, I need, I needed to do something during the summer. Um, because I, mom didn't want me to, you know, sit home and do nothing. Right. So, when I was uh, eight or nine, um, I joined Camp Anchor. Um, actually, my mom got and dad uh, got me on the waiting list because there's a long waiting list. Um, a couple of years before that. And I finally got accepted um, in the summer of 1999. 
and I instantly fell in love with it because um, it's on the beach. Mm -hmm. um, I got to go in the ocean. I got to go in the pool. Um, and just the people there are amazing. Um, of course, all the campers are all disabled, but all the staff and volunteers are able-bodied. Um, and, but um, they never um, treated any, they don't treat the campers like they have a disability. They, they treat them equally. Of course, um, the campers who have developmental disabilities, of course, they need to treat them a little differently. But at the same time, they don't treat them uh, like babies. They treat them like an equal. Danny, if alumni of Camp Anchor want to stay involved, can they? Uh, yes. So, um, we can, you can, we can always, I can always donate to Anchor. Um, I personally, um, they don't, I don't think they would, they can, they do allow, um, some people, um, former campers to be like a volunteer. Nice. I would not do that. I would never do that. Uh, I would, when I was in high school, um, because that's uh, the age that you start volunteering, um, I was approached by, by my guidance counselor and she was like, why don't you volunteer in anchor? I'm like, no, because first of all, I don't want to look after the other campers. I want to actually enjoy my summer. I mean, I would enjoy it, but I would also be looking after campers. I don't want that responsibility during the summer. Sure. I want to be having fun. Amen. Uh, and not have to worry about um, campers getting in trouble and all that stuff. Um, so I never, um, never wanted to be a volunteer or a staff member, um, but I know one person who wasn't a camper who became a volunteer, um, mm. and sh she was able to do it just fine. Um, so the option is open though, I guess is my question for people that want to do it. Yeah, and we, um, so... I guess um, people can, people who are former campers can uh, volunteer there. Um, it's just uh, the administration there are strict and they don't budge on certain things. But um, that one person was lucky, I guess. That's awesome. And um, I was just thinking that, uh, yeah, it, it was great. Now, when you see, you, you said a, a couple minutes ago, you said this, uh, by the way, where can people find out about Anchor? What's the website? It is um, campanchor.org. And I'll, I'll put that in the little chapter section of, of this pod so people can go to it. I think they should know about it because it's impacted two of my yeah. friends in my life, Danny and uh, Max. Many of my colleague friends went to South Air Fresh, South Fresh Air. I don't know if you ever tangled yeah. there, but. Um, I know a few people who went there. And uh, it was, I heard it was two different kind of experiences, I guess, from what I gathered uh, on both camps. Um, I, well, from what I know about uh, Fresh Air is um, that's a sleepaway camp, right. um, whereas, Anchor is a day king. Right. Um, but I don't know much more beyond that. Got it. Well, I I had um, not gotten the opportunity. I didn't take up the opportunity to, to do camp, so that was my loss. But I guess we just 
I grew up a little later than most. I feel like people who went to camp grow up quicker um, than some who don't. I don't know. That was just my experience. <laughs> anyway, um, Danny, this is some, uh, a couple minutes ago of your mom telling you, you're not going to sit in this house. You're going to go out and do something. Yeah. I, I want to focus on like the, what seems to be sometimes people are, how do I be politically correct? I don't know. I just think sometimes the whole mommy's basement thing and that whole idea of staying in, staying inside and that is a real thing. I think there are people who do do that. Yeah. And I mean this on the able-bodied side too. And so when you see that or when you see someone who just kind of sitting there and, and not really moving around doing and perfectly could move around. Yeah. Drive you absolutely nuts. It does. Um, people like that, I really don't associate myself with them because I am active. Well, not right now, but um, I, I'm usually active. So um, I, I might, okay, if you're not going to do anything, I'm not going to associate myself with you. Very, see, that, that is a positive outlook. Um, and again, it's, it's one of those self-worth things, right? Like, yeah. who is in that kind of situation, I think, would say, oh, this guy's disabled. He kind of gets where I'm coming from, right? Yeah. I roll bed on one leg. I don't get where you're coming from. I, <laughs> you were out there. You were feeding the ducks during the pandemic. You don't know where those people uh, are coming yeah. from. And that has to be said. <laughs> that has to be said. Yeah. Um, but in this, and the trans able movement, that's one that also drives me, drives me crazy, but uh, trans and whatever. I want to know something though. Do you think down the road, Danny, we're seeing this cancel culture all over the place. Mm -hmm. And people say there, I mean, there is a sort of a debate. Do we call ourselves differently able or disabled? I personally like both terms. I yeah. like differently able because I think it, it, um, it changes it. We've even seen yeah. baseball take away the disabled list for something else. Isn't that, that to me is ridiculous. I get where they're coming from. It's kind of ridiculous though. But what do you think? Could the name disabled actually be changed to something more sort of softer, I guess you would say? Uh, with the way, every, with the way things are going in this world, I think so. I don't, I don't agree with it because People, I feel person. like people are too afraid of uh, uh, of offend, offending people um, nowadays, and it's like just call it what it is. Well, that's we're disabled. What's the power? We're disabled. We're crippled. We're disabled. We're crippled. They're just words. But they mean something. That's why um, people actually prefer you not to say differently able because I think they feel it takes away from that. I think it's an empowering yeah. term, but I know that some in the community don't think it is. Yeah, I know. This is differently able. I totally agree with um, because it's true. We we do find different ways to do things. But you we have to with it being the norm because you're disabled, I guess, is just the feeling. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. So at the same time, though, we do want to empower our abilities. So yeah. creative with the term to say, we're not actually disabled. We have a disability, but we also have the ability. How do we get people to understand those balances? That's hard. Uh, because I don't I honestly don't think um everyone is going to understand or will never understand um that even though we have a disability that we're able to do things um and that's that's just reality is that's the that's the reality and I you, not, not everyone's gonna understand and we just have to accept that. Um, yeah, I'll ask this question. You ever find, and I know you disassociate from people who might think like this, 
but in your experiences of trying to be social, trying to socialize, yeah. did you ever find someone that said, I'm superior than everybody else over here because I'm giving this kid with a disability a friendship? Like, did you ever find that kind of attitude or not really? Oh, yeah, I have. Um, not, not that blunt, but I've had people from Anchor, actually, volunteers, who became friends with me and Max, um, and, and we genu genu genuinely thought the, this one guy in particular was our friend. Um, he always was uh, hanging out with us um, at Anchor, and then once Anchor and the, you know we we kept in touch with him, and we hung out with him outside of Anchor a few times. But um, as the years went on, um, we and any time that me and Abby wanted to hang out with him, he would either say no right away or say, I'll see, I'll see what, um, what the weekend brings, um, and I'll let you guys know. And literally the day before our hangout, we would have to hunt him down and be like, so are you going to hang out with us or not? And then it would always, nine times out of ten, it would always be no. You're telling so me like an, a we, anger facade, in other words. Yeah, so um, there are people at Anchor who are just, uh, who just put on a, 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 a mask uh, of being friendly towards them. Us because we're just disabled, mm. and not because we want to actually be friends. That's just messed up. I know. Messed up. That is messed up, Danny. But when you talk about this, does it feel relieving to actually get it out there? Or I mean, you're very open about it, so obviously you feel like you have to talk about it. So does it feel relieving to get it out there? It does. I. I've talked about it a few times um, to different people, and each time I do, it feels good. Well, now you're going to be heard on Apple Podcasts, so congratulations. No, um, I have really loved this combo. I feel like I've gotten to know you more than just our random chats about whatever's happening in the world, yeah. which is fun. But I really feel like I'm getting to know Danny, and I hope others who are listening to this do too. And... Um, Disabilities Month, uh, what do you feel, uh, yeah, what do you feel your abilities are to survive, to, to make, to enable you to be part of the society to this day, through 65 surgeries, through all the stuff and hell and back, you're here. Hey, hey, hey. Six, 62, not 62. 65. Sorry, 62. But all of those surgeries combined, you're still here. So what, what keeps you going? What is your ability? What is your what it enables you to be here today? Honestly, um, it's my support system. Mm. Everyone in my life that has been with me, since, the, people, the people who have been with me since the beginning up until the people that I met even a few months ago. Mm. That's powerful. And you're very good at keeping friendships going, so kudos on that one. Yeah. All right, Danny. Well, if I think of more questions, I'll definitely hit you up and do this. We'll definitely do this again. But yes, thank you for being the second episode of the Abilities Hour. This has been really awesome. Thank you for having me. I'm Alex Garrett. We'll talk to you soon.